Thank you very much, Steve. And we have some time <coughs> for discussion. You mentioned that um, one of the problems we have with efficiency is the fact that our buildings don't last very long, or at least uh, so many of them. And uh, but it seems to me that there there might be a, a sort of a backhanded advantage of buildings that that don't last long is you get to rebuild them more efficiently. Now, so so that's one thing. But it seems to me we have that for lots of things like cars. Uh, I drive an old car, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of the fact that I've been driving the same car for 20 years, but of course, it's not a very efficient car. But the trouble is that I don't know how to calculate whether it's a good idea from the point of view of overall energy efficiency yeah. for me to get rid of this old car and make someone build me a, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a plug-in hybrid uh, that's going to be a lot more efficient, but is going to be expensive in all sorts of ways to the environment mm -hmm. as well as to my pocketbook. To so right. so, what's the deal? Where can we so, go to find out that kind of thing? Yeah, and what so, about buildings? Mm -hmm. So so, let me go to buildings. So I I had to eliminate that slide, but the way you build buildings is you make the envelope, the structure, last for a long time, but you leave space for HVAC and communication systems. And people are beginning to do that. There's, there's walkway space between floors, four feet tall, that gives you lots of flexibility. So the envelope stays the same, and yet you can modernize. Every 20 years, you're gonna need, you would want a new HVAC system, a much more efficient one, better controls in the buildings, all of those things. You can do this. Um, in regarding cars, you know, I'm hoping that this 15-year-old car I'm driving will last another 25 years, and because I drive it a thousand miles and I ride my bike. But I have the advantage of living in Stanford. <laughs> but but uh, this is a ticklish thing. I'm sure people have made analysis on that as to what the overall replacement costs to the environment are. But it, in terms, you know, so. But buildings, there is a way. Uh, Stephen, from everything you've done, what would be a good thing that we can implement? What is the easiest way that we could get started? You know, there are many different aspects what we need to do, but is it also country specific in your experience and what could be done like on a level like ours? You know, how can we influence the public? What's the first step that we could take to help on this? Well, it, it depends on whether you're asking for personal or we're asking for nations. And in personal, you, you just pay attention to the way you use energy and, and how you set an example uh, to you, your friends, your family, uh, your students. Uh, on a countrywide basis, I'm a big believer that heavy-handed regulation is probably not the most efficient, that guiding uh, economic decisions is now, the EU started a carbon trading scheme, but it, they, it was ineffective. They gave away too many credits. There was a lot of gaming going on. The price is about five euros per ton of carbon dioxide at the moment. It peaked at around 30. Uh, we need more certainty. So if we start a simple tax on carbon, maybe at 10 euros, and let it gradually increase to 2040 to let's say 60, 80 euros a ton of carbon dioxide. It gives industry certainty. It has to be non, it has to be irrevocable. And once you do something like that, the investments of industry will be very, very good. And people will start to make adjustments. You need that time for people and countries to make adjustments. Now you can say, well, if the EU does this, I was hoping the EU, China, and the United States could come together. I see now the EU and China, at least for the next four years, <laughs> and probably not the United States. Uh, but then you can ask the question, well, if you put in $60 a ton, won't it penalize the EU or China? And I'd say, no, you start today working with the World Trade Organization to allow you to put in tariffs to protect the countries that are taking the leading steps. So their economy is not punished. And so that could be a way of adjusting where 
I don't see how you can negotiate a universal price on carbon through the UN. You just need some major economies to say, we will do this, get the World Trade Organization to buy into that border adjustments are permissible in this situation. That's, that's I think, the thing that will do the most good. Now it works, thank you. Now, uh, Steve, first of all, thanks a lot for a wonderful talk. So I will refer to some of the things, including nuclear energy tomorrow in my talk, so we don't have to have a discussion about it today. But uh, I have a remark and a, and a question. Uh, the remark is, uh, I think you very rightly referred to using photosynthesis, a very old invention of nature in order to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And uh, I think it's often overlooked that there is an additional opportunity for doing that because the higher level of CO2 in the atmosphere means a CO2 fertilization effect. Huh? So in principle, we just burn this CO2 mm -hmm. or the carbon and bring it back to the atmosphere. And this means that the biological productivity of the vegetation on Earth is much higher now. Huh? So the boreal forests are growing like, like crazy, actually. So you could take away. And actually, I just wonder whether this is something you have thought about uh, construction material in the future. You know, if you use cement and steel, it's carbon positive. If you use wood, in principle, <coughs> if it's well treated and managed, it's carbon negative. So will we, will we build the cities of the future from wood? Well, we've had shiny examples of wood structures lasting a millennium. Uh, we forgot how to do this. Uh, there's a famous engineering building at Stanford that was, had structures made of wood, but they didn't have the drainage right. And so moisture got trapped in the wooden structures and they got dry rot. Just like we can learn how to use wind and, and store uh, wind energy in, in water above hill, we can learn how to build wooden structures again that are not, you can prevent the dry rot by proper design. But it's one of those things we forgot over the last thousand years, or certainly over the last 200 years. Steve, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I know that sometimes we have good ideas, but it's very hard to convince the leaders of the nations to really implement. And uh, you were the Secretary of Energy of one of the most important countries in the world. How, how you see that? How easy it was for you to implement your ideas? What was the overall balance after being the Secretary of Energy in the United States and having very good ideas, as we saw? How, was, how easy it was for you, as a Secretary, to convince changes and to implement changes? Well, you have to um, convince people who are not initially aligned that there is going to be some financial benefit. Sadly, in my time in Washington, the four and the third years in Washington, I realized never so bluntly how much money makes the world go round, at least in the United States. And, and so the financial interests uh, have to be, it's just like, you know, New England, Massachusetts, why don't they want clean power? It's not, you know, people who go to universities there, it's the utility companies. And so, so you have to understand what are the pressures and what are the interests and how people uh, could actually lose their investment and how do you help them make the transition. But on the other hand, there were other things that were discouraging. Um, a senator who, who understood uh, from the Midwest, I'd said, but don't you realize in 20 or 30 years, because the Midwest, and as is California, have severe, what may turn out to be perennial water shortages, and that uh, the wells are going deeper, they're getting more brackish, boron in the Midwest is killing the crops, California, it's going to be, and, and they said, Steve, I know this, but my voters are not concerned about what will happen 20 years from today. They want to know whether it rains next week. 
So I think we need leaders to try to lead and to educate uh, the voters that yes, there are very important things in the short term, but there are these longer term issues that you also can't forget because they otherwise they creep up on you very quietly and, um, and then pretty soon you're in a big mess and that's what's happening. So, so you just have to persevere as best one can. Much of the very best stuff was done under the radar screen. You, f you use the money you have to make better research investments. Sub Rose in my talk, I made it very clear that we do not have all the technical answers. We have to have research that can provide us with these other uh, technical answers that we don't have today. Many of my environmental friends say, we have all the answers, we just have to deploy it. But I disagree. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful talk. Um, I'm intrigued to hear that, well, I knew, I think, already that 30% of the emissions come from agriculture, but I'm intrigued to hear that you think that agriculture can go into negative emissions, and I wonder if you could expand on how you think yeah. that might be possible. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you'd look at all the residues, the wheat straw, the rice straw, the corn stover, you look at the wood chips, you convert those into valuable chemicals. Uh, first, the valuable chemicals, because I don't think you're going to compete for $40 oil in the near term or future. Uh, in many of those processes, they're, whether they're fermentation or power processes, there's extra carbon dioxide. You take that carbon dioxide and you mineralize it. You sequester, you do something. You extract the energy content from the residues, and there's tremendous residues out there. Most of the plants are residue. So it, it's that residue stuff. I mean, we're going to be, you know, the land use issue is, is already an issue, and so that's, that's where it comes from. Uh, I was once involved with a company that was trying to ch use cellulases to, ch to turn uh, those uh, cellular components into energy, and uh, it's actually very, very difficult. So It is very difficult. Uh, there's a number of bankrupt companies, or nearly bankrupt companies, uh, because the same reason why wood structures can last 500 years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also tell you that microbes don't like to break it down. It was nature's way of defending itself. And so you need to actually break down these long polymer uh, protected by lignin, there are very inventive ways of doing it. They haven't yet succeeded, whether you can genetically modify the ligand to be attack points, whether you can use other tr pre-treatment processes, which are, n the current ones are very strong acid, very strong base. That's no good because then you have to cleanse it for the enzymes. Or whether you can escape it completely by using pyro, but pyro has e economy of scale. So, so I can go down the list. <laughs> and I've, I've heard of other things which say we should all stop eating meat because, uh, uh, you know, meat <laughs> production produces a lot of uh, carbon dioxide. That we, you know, rice shouldn't be produced because irrigation of rice produces an awful lot of carbon dioxide. But have you thought about the yeah. benefits of intensification of agricultural production on small amounts of land? Because I think that could probably make a big difference. Yes. Uh, there's research going on to actually develop either through genetic modification or breeding rice that doesn't quite require the same treatment. So there are many, many things like that. There are uh, ways now regarding meat. Unfortunately, that was a taboo subject. That was the one thing I was told you cannot tell people not to eat meat. <laughs> uh, and so um, now, even even if it's healthier for you. So it's going to be a matter of education that may maybe you eat less meat. Uh, now, I'm going to say a little tongue-in-cheek, you know, and, you know, the highest, the worst form is beef. It's the most inefficient. And you go down, you know, birds are, you know, a full-size turkey in less than one year, a full-size chicken in less than half a year. So, so, um, and then a farmed fish, but the way we farm the fish is terribly, terrible, it's just bad. <laughs> so these are agricultural practices. Um, in the end, um, we, we need to, again, a new generation maybe will eat less meat. Okay, but I don't, now, the one tongue-in-cheek comment I have to make is a friend of mine, um, David Mackay, who recently passed away, 
uh, wrote relief a book relief called relief. Energy Without the Hot Air, and he said, Lamb is the one exception. Mm -hmm. David, Lamb, why? Because it's grown in New Zealand, and the land isn't good for much else. <laughs> <laughs> That they, they have to let you, they have to you have to wave your hand to them. I want to. There we go. Yeah, th thanks for the talk, Steve. Yeah. Very informative. Here's my question. It has to do more with, with policy. As you point out, there are very important sorts of interest groups that make it difficult for these changes that we're talking about. On the other hand, you are also pointing out how prices are coming down. So the question is, uh, to what extent do you think it, it's feasible uh, without a sort of United Nations uh, agreement, like a Paris Agreement that would impose a price on emissions, to what extent would it be feasible uh, for companies? There are many green companies that feel social responsibility and are actually doing things, and there are states in, uh, in the United States, like California, uh, the problem being, as you know, with the recent elections that we are in danger of sort of uh, moving backwards in, in, in international terms. But do you think this sort of political approach is feasible? Or because there are some that think unless you really have an international agreement, it's, we really won't get there fast enough. Yes, um, I think, um the international agreements come later. The first agreements are unilateral. California led the way unilaterally in many things, in smog control, in building standards, appliance standard efficiencies. They're leading the United States. They happen to be, I think, the ninth or tenth largest economy in the world. Um, so that's important also. Leading the way uh, to many of the things uh, to decarbonize. Um, the next most important are bilateral agreements. Um, I think it, it's fair to say without President Obama and Xi Jinping uh, coming pre before Paris to an agreement that was out there, Paris might not have turned out the way it did. Uh, and so these bilateral agreements are very important. If the EU, that's what I was hoping, if the EU, China, and the United States can get together and say we want a meaningful price on carbon, industry leaders, all the European oil companies and gas companies, Total, Shell, just go on the list, Dot Oil, BP, Royal Dutch Shell, they all have come out together and said, we want a meaningful price on carbon, a slow, steadily increasing meaningful price. We need an ExxonMobil and maybe one other US company to do that, and maybe we can see something in Congress. And so we need a few industry leaders who, who say, this is real, we are still going to survive economically over the next 50, 80 years, but, but you know, they have to, those companies have to be part of the solution. Uh, the European oil and gas companies are, the, the others, not yet. Um, coal, I feel differently about quite candidly. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. But we, could, we should try then with the oil companies that there is a chance. Yeah. I'm trying as best I can, yes. <laughs> quietly and yes, it's, it's very important that a few companies show leadership. Okay, thank you for your talk, Stephen. Um, uh, it's of course exciting to look uh, at uh, these technological breakthroughs and uh, opportunities and the new sequestration opportunities, but um, once you think across them, uh, you are confronted with how to optimize the whole portfolio strategically. And um, I suspect that would lead us into a different type of economy, a more circular bio-based economy, a bio-economy. In the last five years, more than 40 countries have written themselves bio-economy strategies to address the big issues which you have addressed. What do you think about that, that strategic move towards a sustainable bio-based economy? Well, I think 
the bio part of it is very, very important. Um, I would not, even though it's sometimes inappropriately said that I was a you know, proponent or of the glucose economy, I think that's part of it. I think um, that the real solutions as we go forward in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years, it's not so clear. So if you give guidance and a little help to nudge in the right way, uh, a centrally governed strategy, I don't think ultimately, I'm not smart enough to think I know what will happen 20 or 30 years from today. And so you just have to give opportunities to very inventive, very brilliant, not only scientists and engineers, but also business people to, to see that. Just make sure, you know, you're not subsidizing fossil fuel, but if you have a price on carbon, you can actually get rid of a lot of the subsidies on, um, on the renewable energy as well. But, you know, as you may know, we, there's large parts of the developing world who buy their citizens gasoline and kerosene and at very subsidized prices, even though they know the kerosene is killing the people in indoor air pollution, even though, and because the, and when the prices went down, there was a lot of talk, now's the take to lift the subsidy. And only a few countries had the courage to do that. And so, so as long as you subsidize um, gasoline and diesel fuel and things like that, um, it's hard. But it's not only the best technology wins. You have to level the playing fields as well. Uh, there will be more opportunities for questions during the general discussion <coughs> at the end of the afternoon.